So let me go ahead and uh, introduce Dr. Janice Farouk. Um, Dr. Farouk is an assistant professor of electrical and computer engineering at the University of Michigan Dearborn. Um, the research interests he has are broadly in the modeling analysis and optimization of wireless communication systems, cyber physical systems, and Internet of Things. He received his PhD in electrical engineering from uh, New York uh, University, Tendon School of Engineering in Brooklyn. Prior to that, his BS and MS degrees in electrical engineering were from uh, King Abdullah University of Science and Technology and the National University of Science and Technology in Pakistan. Um, he has worked as a researcher at the Qatar Mobility Innovation Center in Doha, Qatar. And during his time at New York University, he was awarded the Athanasios Papalis Award, if I'm not butchering it, and the Dante Yola Award for Excellence in Teaching and Research, respectively. He was also the recipient of New York University Wide Outstanding Dissertation Award in Technology in Applied Sciences in 2021. And today, we're really excited to have him uh, talk about Internet of Things and the curse of massive wireless connectivity, a systems outlook. So I'll let Dr. Janice Baru take it away. Thank you, Murph, for inviting me to this colloquium series. It's a great pleasure to be uh, speaking to students and faculty at DePaul University. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, one aspect of my research that's been focusing on the security of IoT. Um, you know, we all know the Internet of Things has brought uh, a revolution you know, with the massive wireless connectivity around us. Uh, but when does this massive uh, connectivity become a curse? Um, that is where, you know, the focus of my talk today will be and how do we deal with it. And I'm really looking uh, at it from a systems overlook. <clears throat> so without going into the details of um, the device level or um, the underlying technicalities, we can look at things from a more um, systemic level and try to uh, um, to work on problems related to security. So let's get started. Um, until now, um, what we have been dealing with has been uh, an internet of computers. And um, with this current decade, we are now um, moving towards an internet of, internet of things. Uh, and these are fundamentally um, different in the sense that um, we've been working with computers for a long time and we understand the security of, uh, aspects of computers, but the security of things is, is still in its infancy and it's a lot more um, that we still need to learn and to do in terms of securing those IoT devices. Um, and unfortunately, um, the IoT is much more vulnerable to attacks uh, and malicious activity than computers ever were. And that's because of many different reasons that we will see later in the talk today. Um, so here's a brief outline of the talk. Uh, I'm going to describe some uh, security risks in IoT. We will see a broad uh, mapping of the threat landscape in IoT. Um, and then we'll define a, um, um, a system model um, so, so that we can uh, characterize IoT connectivity and see how we can secure them from a very uh, systems viewpoint. Um, and then I'll discuss some uh, results and key findings before we uh, you know, conclude with the takeaways. So um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, the IoT is revolutionizing uh, the operation of electronic systems, and we're seeing new paradigms emerging, such as smart homes, factories, smart buildings, and even smart cities. Um, and, and we see the benefits here. So uh, with IoT and massive connectivity and automation, automation uh, we see that there's a lot of um, improvements and efficiencies. We, um, we see improvements in productivity and so on. So there's no denying that fact, but these uh, automated functionalities are not without their risks. And that's something we need to seriously consider when we, um, when we um, think of deploying IoT and, and uh, moving towards a, a more connected world. 
So one example of an IoT device is uh, these digital uh, voice assistants that we have at home and, and offices and other places. So um, the important thing which is worrying about these systems is that they are becoming increasingly powerful and capable. So when, when I say this, I mean that they have started to interact with critical infrastructure systems and any malfunction originating from these devices could have a uh, disastrous uh, effect. So for example, these devices are able to control um, door locks. They're able to control um, HVAC systems through, those, through the, these smart thermometers. They're also able to um, you know, ask for emergency response through um, smart fire alarms and so on. So, so we see that the interaction with the critical infrastructure is, is pretty um, fluid and seamless. And, and anything that goes wrong here um, could have a very debilitating uh, effect. Um, so the reason why a lot of these devices have security vulnerabilities is first of all, the, the low cost of the devices that we are dealing with. Um, so when the devices are low cost, basically little emphasis is paid on their security and often security becomes an afterthought. Then um, the product development cycle is pretty short for these devices, right? So there's a lot of competition in the market and we have to come up with uh, new improved devices quickly. And oftentimes the security aspects are ignored and we focus really on uh, the connectivity and functionalities. Um, another important thing to note is the interoperability. Um, so inherently the devices have to, to be interoperable because they're an IoT. So they, want, they have to be connected with other devices, but that connectivity also opens doors for uh, malicious activity. So malicious actors or malware or other um, threats can also propagate using the same channels that could be used for communication. So that, that uh, attack surface has to be uh, considered when we, uh, when we look at IoT devices. Uh, and then the overall uh, ecosystem of the IoT is under-regulated. So when, uh, with that, I mean that, um, you know, e even students can go buy off-the-shelf hardware and uh, program it so it directly interacts with critical systems. Right? So that's the level of regulation. We do not have any stringent um, um, design criteria. We do not have stringent security criteria for IoT at this point, and that makes it more vulnerable to security threats. Um, also, there's weaker authentication systems to control devices, meaning oftentimes um, the authentication is, is rel relatively simple, right? So that we do not, do not have like multi-factor authentication or, or more verified type of authentication systems. So that makes it more uh, vulnerable to be taken over by a, a malicious attacker who could then exploit its functionalities to cause larger uh, scale attacks. Okay, so now when we look at the security aspect, um, the two main things that we really uh, want to know is what is the underlying threat model and um, what is the security strategy. So in other words, what could go wrong if um, an attacker takes control of uh, the, you know, the devices and what could he potentially do with them? And then the question is, how do we uh, come up with a security strategy? So uh, I mean, this, this image is, is just a, a motivating example where you know, we are often um, cautioned to not leave our bags and luggage unattended when we are in, in uh, uh, airports or other um, public transportation avenues. And the reason is there's, there's an underlying threat model. And the security strategy in that case is that we do not leave it unattended. And, and perhaps similar line of thought can be uh, translated into the security of IoT systems. And potentially, you know, uh, we will perhaps look at it in, in the next few slides. 
So um, one of the thing uh, that we need to uh, to be clear about is the potential consequences, right? So when, when we say what could go wrong, we really are looking at what what is a potential consequence of uh, attacks. So in IoT systems, things could go really beyond typical denial of service. So in computers, what could happen is you, you're not able to access websites, you're not able to access some services, but when it comes to IoT, things could go physical, meaning that um, there could be actuations, there could be uh, you know, interactions with critical systems and that could um, have a bigger uh, footprint in terms of the impact. So potential example of uh, the consequences um, are the following. So first, first example is about temperature, temperature control in, uh, in smart cities using uh, IoT devices. So for example, if a large number of smart thermometers or thermostats, excuse me, uh, are controlled by a malware and assuming that simultaneously all of them request a change in temperature, then what would happen is there will be a massive surge in power requirements. And that could lead to a grid breakdown. And this wouldn't have happened if one or two devices uh, were compromised. This would happen if a large number of them were compromised and they acted simultaneously at the same time. So I'm just trying to uh, give you an example of how big the consequences could be. So a simple attack through IoT devices could lead to a grid breakdown, and that could have its own uh, fallout that are completely different. Another possibility is imagine um, a large number of smoke detectors, again, which are connected to IoT infrastructure, they generate uh, false alarms in a coordinated way. So all of them generate a false alarm at once. So what would happen is simultaneously, there will be a huge number of fire truck requests. And basically that will step sabotage your emergency re uh, response system. So you see that the, the threats originating uh, from IoT uh, could translate into, uh, into city level or uh, large scale uh, problems. So as I mentioned, the grid breakdown problem, imagine if that grid breakdown happens in a city as large as New York City, um, you know, the, the, uh, the damage or the potential uh, impacts are, are huge and disastrous. So we really have to make sure that uh, the IoT infrastructure is secure and the, the um, interaction with uh, the critical systems is, is protected. Now, once we've seen the consequences, I just want to map out the landscape of the threats. So typically the threats that we are looking at could be uh, segregated into three different types. One is the um, known knowns, meaning the threats that we know uh, uh, which exist, and we also know how to deal with them. So for example, Denial of service attacks are something which is known and you know we know it is there, we know how to deal with it. And one possibility is using uh, anti antivirus and firewalls and, and those type of protection mechanisms. So these are things that we are already can deal with. Then we have the known unknowns. Um, these are things that we know uh, which exist, but we don't know what they are. For example, human behavior. We know humans can behave in a certain way, but we don't know what exactly it is. So, I mean, th these are a little more challenging to deal with. And in, in the talk today, probably we will see uh, one possibility of, of dealing with uh, known unknowns. Um, the last category is the unknown unknowns. And that's something that we do not know, do not even know uh, if it exists or not. So 
that those type of threats are really the ultimate test for cybersecurity. And at this point, obviously, a lot of work is going on. And uh, the thing is, we, we need to understand, uh, again, what could potentially happen and, and then map out strategies on dealing with them. And people are, uh, you know, proposing different uh, metrics and different strategies to attain cyber resilience. But again, it's an open-ended uh, space at this point. Okay, so um, after mapping out the uh, ecosystem and the threat landscape, I uh, had a few examples here of attacks on IoT systems in the past. So the most classic uh, attack that's worth mentioning here is the Mirai botnet. So it, it's a type of an attack which is called a botnet where um, devices are recruited and um, they become bots, meaning they, they are uh, controlled devices. And um, there is a bot master which controls their operation or, uh, or their behavior. So, um, so if a large number of uh, bots are there and the bot master is able to exploit the vulnerabilities in those devices, then it could launch large scale attacks. So the most classic example of this is the Mirai, which happened in 2016. Um, and it originated from uh, IoT devices by using default login and password. So that was a pretty uh, naive way of, uh, you know, uh, or, or a very simple way to attack the system, but that, that's really a, a huge problem because a lot of uh, device owners do not change login and password information. So typically whatever comes stock stays there and it could be potentially attacked through, through that surface. So with, with that attack, what happened is uh, a lot of major websites like Twitter, Netflix, CNN, Guardian were all um, taken off the internet um, for, a, for a significant amount of period. So um, uh, attacks like this, which originate from IoT devices could easily uh, impact other systems, the internet, and also the, um, you know, the um, other infrastructures like power, uh, water and communications and so on. All right, so now I want to come towards the uh, known unknowns in IoT. Um, so one of them, or one possibility of uh, known unknowns is the emerging attacks, which include the advanced persistent threats. And these are really stealthy, uh, prolonged and targeted attacks on systems. So they could use backdoor channels, um, you know, with attacks coming from the supply chain and so on. Um, currently, there are reports that some attacks are, um, you know, exist over IoT devices. And for example, there's something called IOTroop. Um, so there are these type of attacks that exist, and they are, are um, you know, uh, evolving and and living on the uh, on the devices. But at some point, they might fire up and then cause large scale attacks. So the question at, um, at hand is how do we tackle these known unknowns? And potentially one possible way is to, uh, to not leave the devices unattended, right? Inspired from our previous examples on the, um, on the luggage in airports, um, we want to keep a check on our devices and uh, we want to make sure that they're not left unattended. But again, that's something subjective and needs to be translated into more um, concrete terms, which are implementable and um, practical. So- Excuse me, I have a question. Yes, Can I ask a question? Uh, sorry to interrupt you. So among, so among all that, those three categories of attacks, your focus is on known unknown attacks? Uh, yeah. Right. I, I mean, unknown unknowns are attacks that we do not even know that they exist or not. So that's a more open space. So we want to live in a in a space which is confined, and um, but yet it's um, 
it's unknown in a certain way. Okay. Um, so um, if you want to keep a check on devices and make sure that they're not left un unattended, uh, one way is to, to patch devices periodically. And again, patching is a process where um, you make sure that the device um, is not compromised. So even if it was in the past, uh, patching process would make sure that the device returns to its uncompromised state uh, because probably the, the firmware has been flashed or has been updated with any security um, features. Now, the next question would be how often the devices should be patched. Obviously, you, you patch the device, but then it becomes again vulnerable to be uh, infected by uh, malware again. So you could obviously keep doing this forever, but it also uh, impacts the operation of the device. So you, you want to have a balance between patching and the, uh, the risk of an atta attack at a large scale. So eventually, if you are able to patch devices uh, in, a, in a sufficient uh, frequency, you will um, eventually result in a system which would not be attacked at a large scale. Okay, so now I, I'm going to introduce some uh, some you know technical characterization of this problem. Um, and then there are three key design goals in my mind. One is to develop a framework which is secure by design, meaning, that security features are embedded into the design or, or an operation. So it's not a uh, something you have to do externally. Um, then we also want the, the solution to be scalable, meaning it could apply to large scale networks. Um, and it needs to be manageable, meaning it could be implemented in a distributed manner. So we do not want a centralized planner to do anything. We want things to, to happen uh, in a distributed way where each device makes sure uh, that it is protected and hopefully that translates to a larger scale uh, security. So here, here's the network model that, that I'm looking at. I'm considering um, a um, spatial distribution of IoT devices. So basically um, consider a, an IoT device as, um, as a device with radio capabilities and computational capabilities, um, but then there are many of them in the 2D space. Um, so we model them with a homogeneous uh, Poisson point process. And the Poisson point process is basically saying that um, these devices are modeled uh, basically, their locations are modeled as uh, points which are distributed randomly in the space. So uniformly randomly, if we assume that these are uh, devices located in the space, then, uh, then uh, each device can only communicate to its neighbors within a certain region. And that region here is demarcated by this uh, circle R, circle of radius R. So any device within this um, within this range can be, you know, can be reached from the device at the center, and anything outside is not reachable. So if this is the communication radius or communication range, then basically this is really the attack uh, pathway as well. So if the device has a malicious process running on it, that malicious process could also uh, use that communication capability and get itself replicated or installed into the neighboring devices. Um, so in the previous model, basically we are assuming the, the density of the process is Lambda and uh, a typical device which is located in the center um, is basically um, has an NI number of neighbors. And, and this, this is basically controlled by um, 
the density of the process. So the degree of the device is actually how many number of neighbors it has. So because we are dealing with a point process, which is a random process, so this degree is also random. So if you consider any device in, uh, in, the, in the 2D space, that device has a random number of neighbors connected to it. And, and the, the probability distribution here is known because we're, we started off with a known process. So luckily with uh, the Poisson process, the degree of any typical device is uh, distributed according to a Poisson uh, random variable. Okay, so I have a question in the chat. Basically Lambda is the average number of uh, nodes in the space. Mm -hmm. So probably have to go back here to clarify this. So it's, it's a Poisson point process. A point process is a spatial process where things are distributed in space. Uh, it, it's not a, uh, um, it, it's not the counting of the number of events over time. It's really a counting of the number of nodes in, uh, in unit area. So if you consider the whole space, we, we, we can count how many number of uh, devices there are in a, uh, you know, a unit area. Uh, Janine, are you yes. comfortable answering questions during the talk or do you want them to be at the end? It's all I right. Can... I, I, uh, okay. It's fine. Ask okay, so with, the, with this, basically the statistics of the degree of devices is known. So the average number here, obviously is coming from the Poisson distribution and, and that's, related to how dense the process is and how big the communication rate is. So if the process is very dense, you will have a large number of neighbors. If the communication range is very large, you will have a large number of, again, the large number of neighbors. Okay, so to see if, if that model really uh, could be a practical model or whether such a model really exists in real life, what I did is to to validate it using uh, data from New York City uh, open a database. So I looked at the locations of uh, public hotspots in New York City. So these red dots here on the map basically show you where the link NYC as they call it, uh, those nodes are located. And if I consider a small region in, in the Manhattan district, and try to study their um, connectivity uh, from a degree standpoint. Uh, I'm assuming here that each node has a communication range of 140 meters. Uh, then the degree profile or the degree distribution um, looks like this histogram here on the right. So uh, the red line is, is the Poisson approximation that or the Poisson model that we are using, and the blue are the the uh, blue bars are the histogram. So basically, um, we see that there is a um, somewhat of a fit here, and 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 the Poisson approximation can can be reasonably used as a uh, as a connectivity model, you know, illustrating how connected the network is and what is the uh, degree of an individual device in the network. So once I have this model characterizing uh, how nodes connect to others and, and how many neighbors they have, basically we can start on to add some uh, threat model on top of it. So the threat model here is inspired from a botnet or a, um, you know, uh, a system where there is a bot master which is able to control um, compromised devices. So what I do is I um, I model this uh, on, on that um, you know on that um, system and and assume that the devices could be either vulnerable or they are. Uh, uh, so th they are either regular um, devices with regular processes running on them, on them, 
or they could be infected with a malware process. So there's two possibilities. Um, so the first thing we, uh, we um, come up with is assuming that a, a small proportion P of the network is vulnerable and the others are not. Obviously, because they might have enhanced security features. So our model incorporates this possibility that some devices may never be able to uh, be compromised. And remember, this is a mean field model. So it's a large scale system. Um, the, the nodes are extending in, in, to infinity on, on all sides. So, um, so in, an, in such a large network, we can as model, um, we can model vulnerabilities using a single parameter P. Um, then we introduce the, uh, the notion of a malware spreading rate. So this is a rate of spreading of malware towards its neighbors. So if a device is infected, it is the malware is trying to spread to other neighbors at a rate of uh, gamma B here. And it is also trying to spread control commands in its neighborhood at a rate of gamma C. And rate here could be interpreted as a probability of successfully transmitting the commands or successfully transmitting the malware to the neighbors. Sorry, Janine. Uh, uh, yes. Could control command be interpreted as a useful transmission of data that the network is meant for? Or is that a... So, so the, the purpose of control command here is to issue instruction for launching an attack. Oh, I see, I see. So no, I get it. There are two different uh, processes going on. One is to try to replicate the malware to make other devices as bots. And the, the purpose of the control command is to provide instructions on agreeing to a, an attack point. Okay. So, I mean, these two hand in hand will try to launch a large scale attack. Now, um, if the device is patched, then the assumption here is that, you know, it gets rid of all the malware. It returns to a uncompromised state and we lost the commands, we lost the bot status. Okay, and finally, to, to make sure that the wireless physical layer is also taken care of, we introduce a parameter rho, which uh, defines the probability of successful message transfer over the wireless link, right? So just to make sure that the effects of fading and path loss and other factors in the wireless transmission are also considered, um, we introduce this uh, parameter rho. Okay, so next comes the, um, the dynamics of the malware over such networks. So the diagram on the left shows the top view of different devices in the network and um, the red nodes here are the infected nodes and the greens are the, um, the regular uh, nodes. So if, um, if a device has to be infected, then um, its neighbors um, have to be infected, right? But it's more complicated than that because for the neighbors to be infected, the device also has to be infected or some of its other neighbors. So there's like a, um, um, there's like a, a two way link here. Just like if I could uh, potentially transmit the COVID uh, to you, you could also potentially transmit it to me. So it's not only one way, it's, there's a two way interaction here. But, but just considering uh, one node here in the center, um, we first identify uh, what are the possible states that this device could be in. So uh, I'm, I'm proposing three states here. Uh, one is the uncompromised state where there is no malware process running on it. The other is the, um, is the state where it, uh, the device is a bot, but it is not informed of the control command. And the third state is where the device is bought as well as being also informed of the uh, control command. So, so these three uh, states can be linked here in this state evolution diagram and the transitions between them 
uh, depend on what is the degree of the device, which is k, and what is the probability that the um, that the straight transition will happen, which is sigma one here and the sigma two here, with um, you know signifying the transitions from different states. Uh, the parameter mu is actually the patching rate. So whichever state we are in, uh, the 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 rate of mu will bring them back to the original uh, uncompromised state. And for model completeness, I also introduce a parameter beta here that brings the uh, informed state to an uninformed state. So basically, assuming that the control commands are lost somehow. Okay, so uh, in this model. As I said, sigma one and sigma two are the probabilities of the uh, the transmission or the state transition. Um, sigma one could be further characterized in terms of the vulnerability of devices, in terms of the transmission probability success, and the rate of uh, propagation of the bots. So sigma one depends on gamma b, rho b, and also the the probability that um, that a degree k device points to an uncompromised device. So this is a um, another factor that um, that needs to be considered. Sigma two, on the other hand, is uh, depending on rho, which is the success probability of transmission, because it's just the uh, information or the control command that needs to be uh, transmitted. There is the parameter gamma C, which is the propagation rate, and also the parameter theta bi, which is the probability that the particular link of degree k uh, device points to an un, uh, points to an informed bot device. Right. So there are these um, factors that have to come together in order for the state transition to occur. Um, so now we have this model. And we can translate this, this into a set of dynamical equations. So for a typical device, um, the rate of um, change of um, the first state, which is uh, the bot state, can be directly written in terms of these parameters using the state transition diagram that I just showed. So this uh, rate of change can also be interpreted as the probability that a particular device of degree k is in that state, right? So it's a mean field model. So um, if you look at the whole population, uh, this, this rate of change will signify how many devices are in a particular state. But if you look at just one device, it could be, it could be interpreted as the probability that the device is in, in that particular state. So from that state transition diagram, I can get these um, dynamical equations. And we also know that there is a closure relationship here because uh, obviously all three populations in the network add up to one. So basically one of them is redundant. So we could actually simplify equation three, four, and five to just two equations, six and seven. Um, so these are equations which are in terms of the patching rate, in terms of the node degree, uh, the parameters sigma one and the sigma two. Now the the first thing we have to do is to figure out what is the equilibrium of the system. Like where does the system settle in terms of the populations of in, uh, bot nodes and informed bot nodes? So to do that, we simply um, equate the rate of changes to zero and we try to solve the system. So to solve this, basically we need to solve equations eight and nine. But interestingly, um, the, the uh, equilibrium populations, which is BK star and BIK star, they depend on the probabilities theta B tilde and theta BI. Um, and these by definition, also contain uh, B tilde and BI. So it's a self-consistent system that we are looking at. What, you know, the, the two quantities depend on thetas, but thetas depend on those two quantities. So this system has to be solved where we need to find a fixed point where the, the, the balance uh, occurs. And it's a complicated problem because the degree distribution, which is uh, here, 
is a Poisson distribution, which is complicated and it's uh, difficult to solve this analytically. So we have to uh, resort to the first order approximation of the expectation to come up with some characterization of the solution. Uh, and if we do this, this is the approximate thetas, which are probabilities that, you know, the a node of degree K is pointing to another informed or another compromised node. Uh, we also have to, to bound these with either one and zero to make sure that these probabilities don't exceed one and are also above zero. So at least with, with the first order approximation, we can get an analytical characterization of these probabilities. Now to further um, improve the utility of these expressions, we could uh, you know, convert them, convert this min and max to smooth functions, right? So we could do a, a smooth and continuously differentiable approximation using these exponentials. Uh, and once we do that, these become usable for uh, the sake of optimization and other uh, purposes. Okay, so um, after characterizing the equilibrium, once we get the thetas, we actually get the equilibrium proportions of the, the bot populations and also the informed bot populations. But uh, one thing which is you know, interesting here is the, the model allows us to find some fundamental limits in the system. So first uh, limit is about the patching rate. So with this analytical modeling, we could figure out that the patching rate for a degree K device is always less than some quantity, which depends on pro, gamma, B, P, and the expected value of the degree K. So uh, no matter um, you know, how high things or, or what, what the values of the parameters are, um, you know, any patching rate higher than this number will not be useful, right? So we've found out if you want to patch devices, uh, this is the maximum uh, that is helpful. Okay, and these are in, in terms of the system parameters, which is the average degree, the vulnerability of devices, the rate of propagation of the bots, and uh, the wireless channel parameters. Now, also the information refresh rate beta can also have a fundamental limit, meaning if you refresh faster than this, basically, um, there's no utility. Okay. Um, all right. So as I mentioned earlier with the probabilities that we computed uh, in an approximate way, uh, basically we could come up with the exact expressions for the equilibrium populations of the, um, the bots and the informed bots, right? So these populations also uh, can be interpreted as a probability that a typical device is in, in, in that particular state, um, which is B uh, tilde or B I. So uh, interestingly, these results look messy, but they are uh, smooth functions of the, the patching rate. And from a network defender point of view, we could formulate a problem, an optimization problem, and making sure that uh, you know, the populations of these devices in the network can be controlled. So um, those, th that optimization uh, could give us some, some uh, patching rates which we can implement in a distributed manner. So the trade-off here is that if we patch too much, you know, we cause a large uh, disruption to regular operations of devices um, because we have to do firmware upgrades or power cycling or you know, other activities which lead to downtime. Uh, but on the other hand, if we patch uh, very little, basically there's a higher chance that a large number of devices are in the bot state and they could launch a, a large scale attack. So from a defender's uh, standpoint, I formulate an optimization problem. This optimization problem says that we want to minimize the impact on the network. Um, so this impact is modeled using a function phi, which is increasing in terms of the patching rate. So if we patch too high, we will have a huge impact. So we want to minimize the average impact on the network. 
um, subject to the condition that the average populations of bots and the average populations of informed bots are within some uh, certain ranges. Right, so these thresholds are, are the, the target proportions that we are uh, designing the system for. Okay, so if we uh, try to implement this for some certain proportions, these are the results we get. So on the x-axis, we see the degree of devices and on the, uh, the, the blue lines here show the optimal patching rates, which correspond to the um, degrees and the degree distributions are shown with the orange, orange bars here. So the orange bars are actually showing you the probability of existence of a certain degree in the network. And the blue lines are the, the patching rates. So if, if a degree, if a device has degree 10, meaning it is connected to 10 devices, it should be passed at, at these rates uh, corresponding to the target threshold. And, and we see here that if the, um, the target threshold increases, we are actually in, increasing the patching rates up till a certain level shown, shown by this dotted line here. And this dotted line is exactly the, the, the theoretical upper limit that we derived in our analysis. So our fundamental limit is this, this value here. And if we have ambitious thresholds on the populations of the bot devices, uh, you know, that's going to uh, increase the patching rates up till this uh, point here. And again, we could repeat these for other uh, informed bot targets and, and we see similar uh, results for the patching rates, which are optimal in terms of the cost function. Uh, I have a quick simulation here, which uh, clarifies things a little bit better. So what I had is a network of devices and, and I in, infected a seed virus somewhere here and that seed virus starts spreading to its neighbors and then onto its neighbors until the uh, entire network gets uh, infected. So there are two, two symbols here. One is simply a red dot, the other is a circle around it. Circle represents the node is also informed on top of being a bot. So what, what I did here is from the seed virus, I let that uh, malware spread in the network and over some time, you know, eventually all the network, including this node will be compromised. And at some point, uh, time T1, we will start patching nodes with an optimal patching rate that we derived. And that's going to quickly start recovering the network back to its original state uh, and hopefully reaching the target of 90%, which is set in the optimization. So you see that we start patching and that started to return the devices towards its uncompromised state. Uh, it's important to see here that the malware is still spreading and the patching is also going on. So these are processes which are disconnected. They're happening in a distributed manner. Uh, every device is implementing uh, its own patching policy, its own rate of patching. But we see that overall, the average number of nodes um, which are um, uncompromised is around 90%, which is designed in the, in the uh, which was the target set in the optimization problem. So even though different portions of the network or different nodes in the network may uh, keep being infected and uninfected, but on average, um, the, the target that we've set is, is achieved in terms of the uh, being compromised. So I've repeated this for uh, different Right, so like 90%, 80%, and 70% uh, thresholds. And we see that, um, you know, the, the system can achieve the desired uh, target thresholds if we do this for a, a Poisson point process uh, network model. But to also see whether such a policy may also be uh, practical in real networks, I went back to the, uh, you know, the NYC. Uh, locations, and I started implementing it there. Uh, 
in, in simulations. So obviously uh, the algorithm works. And what we saw here is again, for these three thresholds of 70, 80, 90%, we see that we are actually doing better than expected. So uh, even though it is designed for 70% uh, uncompromised nodes, uh, we are still able to achieve uh, above 85%. And the reason for this is that um, the Poisson point process is really a worst case model, right? So it's an uncorrelated model. And uh, in reality, uh, the networks do have correlation, so um, the, the framework works much better than expected. Uh, so that brings me to the summary of what uh, we saw today. Um, I, I just tried today to, to give you uh, a brief overview of security challenges in the IoT. We saw some past attacks and some of the emerging threats in the IoT systems. Um, uh, and I tried to, to use some system science application to security problems uh, with a focus on preventing stealthy botnet formations. Uh, and it, it was really integrating network science, dynamic population processes, and optimization together to come up with a uh, security framework for large scale uh, systems. Um, so before we end today, I, I just want to um, uh, give you this uh, important message here. Um, this is something which, which really caught my attention uh, perhaps a year ago or more uh, before. So a person in Berlin, um, he used 99 phones to, uh, you know, in a, in a trolley and, and was trying to drag it on the road. And what happened is this tricked Google Maps into thinking that there's a traffic jam, right? So um, the, the point I want to make is that cyber physical threats are, are real and, and, it's, and these sort of uh, attacks are, are going to be of great concern in the future. So we really need to focus on the security of uh, cyber physical systems and IoT systems. And, and um, the, the uh, important thing is that cyber physical systems need a cyber physical perspective. We cannot just look at them from a lens of uh, traditional computers where we just had DOS attacks. Uh, this is more physical than, than computers. And perhaps system science could be a potential gateway uh, to leverage theoretical advancements and translate them to you know, practical security solutions. Uh, with that, I, I would like to thank you and, and uh, look forward to your questions.